Welcome to the Christian Ministries Church Podcast. My name is Josh Barnett. I'm one of the pastors on staff here. We're praying that this message equips and empowers you to live in the kingdom of God. Well, I'm uh, excited about sharing the word with you tonight. Uh, I'm going to make this announcement too. Uh, our young adults, if you're like 18 to 25-ish, around there, uh, we're starting a... Uh, series on the spiritual giftings tomorrow night at my house that we're going to be doing every second and third Thursday of the month, the rest of the semester. So me and Bergen and Howie have been getting this ready and we're excited to host you guys at the Barnett household tomorrow night. So young adults, y'all don't miss out on that. Well, uh, turn to, <laughs> I said 18 to 25. -ish. <laughs> young is relative, I guess. So you got to throw the age in there. Um, Ephesians chapter six, Ephesians chapter six, I've so loved this uh, series, and I, I, I came across this today, and I feel like it so echoed what, what Paul was talking about being filled with the Spirit last week, and I, I just wanted to read it to you. It says, the word filled means controlled by. The simplicity of the message of Ephesians is that God lives in me and wants to control me. I must bow and yield and surrender to him. That is the simplicity of the message. The entirety of Ephesians is that right there, that God lives in me, and he wants to control me. In the Zoe life, um, as we get into chapter 6 here, human relationships should take on a different spirit and attitude. And we see that at the end of chapter 5 where Paul begins talking, he begins talking about husband and wife. And then at the beginning of chapter 6 here, he begins talking about uh, more relationships. And he talks about parents and children. And then he gets into even uh, working relationships. And so let's look at verse 1 here. Children, obey your parents because you belong to the Lord, for this is the right thing to do. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. If you honor your father and mother, things will go well with you, and you will have a long life on the earth. Verse 4, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger by the way that you treat them. Rather, bring them up with the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. So let's talk about this Zoe life and family for a few minutes here. Now, it's talking about children obeying their parents, but parents, we have to understand that we have the responsibility of teaching our children obedience. We have the responsibility of teaching our children obedience. They know how to disobey. And if you don't believe that, just volunteer in our nursery next week, and we'll, you'll see they know how to disobey. They must be taught how to obey. And Scripture is clear on this, that a, that a parent who doesn't discipline their child, Scripture says, hates them. Proverbs 13, Hebrews 12 makes it very clear that if we don't discipline our children, that we hate, that we hate them, that they are actually illegitimate, they're actually orphans, <laughs> because a real father actually disciplines his kids. So, and parents too, like you, I, I feel like I see a lot of parents live frustrated with their children over something you didn't train them to do. And so you can't be frustrated over something that you did not set up. When we are driving to church on the way here, we are setting up our kids for the way that they're going to behave on the second row. And if they don't behave that way, we lay out here are going to be the consequences if you don't behave this way. Yeah. And I, cause I can't be frustrated if I'm not training and teaching my child how to sit still, how to behave, how to whatever. And so, it, it, you know, it's important that we are instilling, it's not just going to happen. We have to be intentional in the way that do we discipline our children. Now, the incredible thing about this too is, okay, guys, if you do these things in church and you listen and you take notes and you, and you don't run all over the place after service, here is your reward. You'll get a reward. Mom and dad want to reward you if you do the right thing. And so that, that is teaching and training uh, discipline. Now, obviously, it, it warns us too, don't provoke them to wrath. How can we provoke children to wrath? Well, big way you provoke them to wrath is inconsistent discipline. If it's not the same every single time, they grow frustrated because they are confused. And they, they, it's got to be the same every single time. It, they, it, you, we provoke our children to wrath when we discipline out of crisis or out of anger. Out of anger. It, 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 a lot of times parents, they just get so far to where we, we just snap on them. And that frustrates them, that provokes them to anger. And, and this word that Paul is using here, provokes to anger, it's not just provoking to anger like they're just going to get mad at you, but it's a provoking to anger of like when you do these things over a period of time, they're going to grow up to resent you. 
That's Paul's warning here. Being overly critical and legalistic provokes to anger. We've got to, and parents, we've got to be under control when we discipline. We can't discipline out of anger. We've got to discipline under the control of the Lord. We're supposed to train and admonish our children in the ways of the Lord. And now parents, listen, it's not the kids pastor's job. It's not the youth pastor's job to discipline your children. It is your job. God clearly puts it on our shoulders. Now, kids pastor, youth pastor, they will compliment. They will be an echo, but they're supposed to be an echo of what you're already teaching. Now, the goal with training children should be to win their hearts. The goal with training, because there's actually, so when, when I tell my children what to do, there's, there's, there's basically, there's three responses they have. When I tell my kids to clean their room, they can either obey me out of fear, which sometimes they need to. They don't feel like doing this. They're five years old. They're still learning. So there's the fear of if you don't do this, here is the consequences that's probably going to involve spanking. That is out of fear. I'm going to go do this. There can be a out of want to. I'm going to they're going to clean their room because they want to make the, chore, the, the, the allowance. You get allowance or you get paid for doing chores or whatever. There can be that, like I want to, you know, some kids like, well, I, well dad, I cleaned my room. It's like, really? And I didn't tell you, that's awesome. And then a few minutes later, it's like, dad can I have 20 bucks. <laughs> yeah, right? So there's like this, the manipulation thing, I guess. But so there's, there's out of fear, there's out of want, but the goal is to get our children to obey out of love that they obey because they love us and want to please us. Now, we, now Sarah and I find this with our, and we're, we're pros at this. We've got four kids, and so we're pros at having children. Um, we've got a fifth one on the way. Um, here we go. David Hilton told me a few weeks ago that he was going to get me a Nintendo, so because uh, apparently we're bored and don't have anything to do. And, uh, and so... <laughs> We got five kids, and so and and they range they range the ones that are here already. They range from ten to three, and so we're right in the middle of all of this. And I will say, the more that I connect with my kids, the more that I hang out with my kids, the more that I show love to my kids, the more they want to obey and please me. But the more that I'm on this, the more that I'm at work, the more that other things come before them, the more that. What, the more that I say no to playing t-ball, the more that I say no to going out and shooting arrows, the more that I say no to riding bikes, the more that I say no, the more that I do that, the more that they are frustrated and provoked to anger and don't want to or desire to obey and please me. And so the goal with our children is to win our hearts. Now, I've got a lot that I want to say about kids, but obviously there's not really a lot of kids in here. Um, but, but definitely there is this, there's this theme in here where Paul, and you didn't really, you don't really see this a whole lot in the old Testament besides the 10 commandments, but, but Paul is in, is showing children. And this isn't just little kids. This goes all the way up to like, if you live in your parents' household, but there's this, this Paul is inviting the kids into the family of God much more in the new Testament and putting responsibility on them to obey and to honor and to do so with a God-like attitude. Now, and I think this is an interesting point too. Many times we split the Ten Commandments up four and six, that the first four are about God and the last four are about loving our neighbor. Um, but the Jews split it up five and five because they saw honoring your father and mother as honoring God. And so, that, so that's that key. And that's why Paul says, you're supposed to obey your parents in the Lord, as unto the Lord. And so, it's, so, so kids from a very early age have got to get an understanding of that obedience to their parents or their guardians or their grandparents or their teachers or their coaches or whoever is obedience unto God, first of all. And they've got to know that, they've got to know that the authority that's been placed over them, that, they're, that it's because that God has put that person in that authority. And so by honoring their parents, they are actually honoring the Lord. Paul is echoing Malachi 4, 6, which talks about that, the, that I'm going to send the, someone in the spirit of Elijah. He's going to turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers. But I think what's interesting about that verse is at the end of Malachi 4, 6, it says, and if this doesn't happen, I will come and smite the land with a curse. Whoa, that's intense. You see that in our nation today. You have fathers who are absent, 
who are abusive. They've called the, specifically the millennial generation, the Gen Z generation. They've called them the fatherless generation. And they're the generation that's just gone off the rails. If you want to fix America, we need to go back 20 years and put a godly father in every single home. We wouldn't be in the mess that we're in today if we had godly fathers in every single house. Okay, so you've got fathers who are, who are not present or who are abusive, and, that, and then you've got children who are rebellious. God is never going to bless a nation where fathers and children are at odds. That is the whole key fix here. And, and, and Paul clearly, in this section here, he puts it on dads. He puts it on the men. He put it on the men in chapter 5 with their wives. He puts it on the men here in chapter 6, that it is the, it is the husband's job to love Christ uh, to love their wives as Christ loves the church, and it is their job to train up their children. <clears throat> and now listen, when I am full of the Spirit, when I am living in relationship with God as I should be, and the love of the Lord is flowing through me, I'm connecting with my wife, and I'm connecting with my kids, and that creates an environment of the Zoe life where they want to submit to me. They want to please me. But when I'm full of stress because I've distanced myself from the Lord or I've gotten too busy for God and I'm full of stress and I'm full of anxiety and I'm full of frustration, I'm not pleasant to be around. And my home gets really disrupted a lot of times based on where's daddy's heart. Where's daddy's heart? Colossians 3.21 says, Fathers, do not exasperate your children and cause them to lose heart. Dads, we've got to be careful that we're not provoking and exasperating our kids by maybe putting too much of a burden, being inconsistent, uh, you know, wanting them to be perfect. Uh, not Kids want responsibility. And you, can, you actually clearly can see this. Scientific studies show this. Psych- psychological studies show this, is that kids who have been given responsibility by their parents, chores or such, they turn out much more mentally healthy than those who do not have any. Children want responsibility. Whether they know it or not, they want responsibility. But we've got to be careful that we don't provoke or exasperate by uh, uh, not requiring anything of them, not being present, by living a double standard, right? If we're Mr. Holy on Sunday morning, but then on, but then on Monday, Monday night you get home from work and it's been a stressful day at work and you take it out on your kids with your attitude and you're not pleasant to be around. Talking to me too. We've got to bring our children up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord, teaching them how to live the Zoe life. And that is a training, that is a setting of boundaries, that is a showing them like, hey, if you step outside of these boundaries, there are consequences. But if you stay in these boundaries, there's great reward. There's great reward. And Paul shows us that later, even in in verse 8. Without the Zoe life in family, the society, the culture won't have Zoe life either. It starts in the home. Family is the building block of everything else. It's the building block of church, communities, cities, nations. And they will not ex- those things will not experience Zoe life until the family is whole. All right, let's move on. Verse 5. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with deep respect and fear. Serve them sincerely as you would serve Christ. Try to please them all the time, not just when they are watching. As slaves of Christ, do the will of God with all your heart. Work with enthusiasm as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. Remember that the Lord will reward each one of us for the good that we do, whether we are slaves or free. Verse 9, masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Don't threaten them. Remember, you both have the same master in heaven, and he has no favorites. Now, obviously, this was written in the middle of the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire had estimated around 6 million slaves. So this was like a natural part of the ancient world. This or not natural part. This was a part of the ancient world. This was a part of the economy. They were, you know, they were, they were slaves and there were masters and the slaves weren't getting free. This was just the whole empire ran on slavery. And, and Paul here doesn't, he's not condemning slavery. He's rather teaching slaves and masters how to behave towards one another. Now that you are believers Here is the way that you're behaving. He's not condoning it. He's not promoting slavery, but he realizes there are lots of people coming into the kingdom of God that don't have a choice whether they're going to be a slave or not. And so he's letting them know, hey, here's the way that God calls you to live. And masters, now that you are a believer, here's the way that you should treat 
your slaves. Now, obviously, that is not the way that our economy works. That is, we are not, we, 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 our economy is not built on slavery. We have a free market, but we can still apply these principles to our work lives. We can still apply these principles. So let's talk about the Zoe life in work, in employment. Um, our world has it so backwards. Our world, um, we, we look at work as what can, what can my job do for me? What can my boss do for me? What can my company do for me? What can the world do for me? It's a me first mentality. And that is not supposed to be the attitude of a spirit-filled believer. The attitude of a spirit-filled believer should be, what can I do for my boss, for my company, for my customers? The attitude of me first and give me, me, me is not found in the life of a believer. It's not supposed to be found in the life of the believer as you look at the New Testament. The Zoe life requires an attitude of service, an attitude of putting others first. Colossians 3.23 says, whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men. This is the attitude of the spirit-filled believer. And we have a lot of Christians in the workplace with non-Christian bosses and non-Christian co-workers. What better testimony than when we have a God-like attitude, when we live the Zoe life before and in front of people. And it, 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 it boggled my mind, the, the, honestly, the first time I'd see it. I remember the first time I was, uh, I was 16 years old and I, was, I, was, uh, I had to do some community service because I got a really bad speeding ticket. But um, that's besides the point. But I, but I went to this place and we were having to do this community service and my mindset, was all, it was always trained in me from guys like Tim and his son-in-law, Mike. It was trained in me. You, just, you work really hard like you're doing it for God all the time. And I remember going into this place and me and this guy were supposed to be cleaning this bathroom and we had finished this one bathroom and we were going around to the other bathroom and the guy was like, no, hang on, wait. Because our boss lady, she had like left. He's like, let's just chill here for a minute. And I was like, huh? I was like, no, we got a job to do. And he was like, no, just wait here. And I was like, I'm not waiting. Like, you can stay here. I'm going to continue working. But then I began to come across and find, man, there are so many people who are just trying to get out of as much work as possible. And, and whenever I, I did landscaping while I was in college, and I remember Christian men going, we would, I would go to working with a bunch of Christian men. We would go to lunch uh, throughout the day, and we, 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 when we came back, we had to write in our lunchtime. And we would be at lunch for an hour, and they would write 30 minutes. And it just like blew my mind. Like that's stealing. You're stealing from your employer. And I just couldn't believe that. That's not the way that the spirit-filled believer is supposed to live at work or, or how he's supposed to approach his job. This, this attitude that we have going into work should be that everything we're doing is if it is unto Christ. Work like it's for the Lord. And, and you think about if you're if you're an employee, if you work somewhere, if you have coworkers, you should be a joy to work with. You should be a joy to work with. If you are a spirit-filled believer, you should be a joy to work with. Well, I've got these bills and this stress and my boss and this work and this job and this whatever. That, that just doesn't sound like someone working with the mind of Christ. We should work to please and be a joy to your boss. Be a joy to your boss. Work to please your boss, especially when they're not around. Especially when they're not around. Because it, well, and you've got to have the understanding, it's because it's for the Lord. And your boss may not be around, but the Lord is. There's always three witnesses, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Always. <laughs> it's for the Lord, He always sees. And listen, make yourself valuable to your workplace. Make yourself valuable to your boss. It should be said of every Christian that he is a hard worker and he gives his employers a full day working for his pay to do anything less is to steal from your employer. Well, it's like, well, I could, well for this wage, I'm not working very, I'm not going to work that hard. And it's like, well, you're never going to get promoted and you're never going to get a raise because you're not proving to your boss that you're worth the wage that he's paying you now. Become worth what he's paying you now and then he'll give you more. Actually, outperform what he's paying you now and then he'll pay you more. That's the way that works. And if not, other people will hear about how great of a worker you are, and they will pay you more to come work for them. So that's the way it works. It's free market. Employers, if you're a boss, a manager, if you're in charge, be a joy to work for. Be a joy to work for. Reward, promote, teach, encourage. Don't lead others with fear. You know, like, do your employers have an ulcer in their stomach from working with you? 
working for you? Do they dread coming to work for you? One thing I love about working here at the church is like I love, I just moved offices to where I'm, I'm, I'm now here. I'm not in the youth center anymore, but I'm, I'm back here. And so I pull in and, I, and, and now Tim is right downstairs for me. I love working for Tim. Tim is a joy to work for. He's an, he's an absolutely incredible boss. And I'm not just trying to suck up to him because he's my boss right now. He's, he actually, he really is an incredible, he, I, I don't dread coming to work. I actually was thinking today, I can't believe this is a job. I can't believe that I get to do, this is so much fun that I get to do this all the time. That I get to teach people a biblical worldview, that I get to disciple kids, that I get to work with interns, that I get to teach the Bible all day long. And that may sound terrible and boring to you, but I love it. And I like couldn't believe that as I was preparing this message today too, I was like, I can't believe that this is my job, that I get to do this. It's such a joy. It's such a joy. Employers, be consistent. Walk in joy. Lead the thinking of your coworkers. And I'll never forget this. Uh, Stephen Sexton gave me this advice uh, a long time ago when I first started working here, about 12 years ago. He said, be an employee that doesn't need a staff meeting. The reason that places have to do staff meetings is because people lose vision. People lose vision. Don't lose vision. People lose motivation. Be a self-motivator. Be a self-motivator. And it's really easy to be a self-motivator when you're filled with the Spirit when you're filled with the Spirit. Every place I've worked from the time that I was 16 years old, I have been promoted. I have been given raises because I worked as unto the Lord. And I know you all want to come up here and pat me on the back, but my hand's in the way. Um, but, but, I'm, but I'm serious. That was the, the key to my promotion. And, and, and when I was in college and doing landscaping every day, I would, be, I would be put in charge. And I couldn't believe I was put in charge because I was like 19, 20 years old. But I was put in charge of guys that were 35, 40, 45 years old, running crews of six, seven, eight men at landscaping jobs. And I'm thinking, why am I doing this? Well, it's because I showed up on time, I had a good attitude, and I worked my rear off. And that's why. And I got paid more than them. And I got promoted more than them. And I got more benefits than they did. And I got more privileges than they did. And when somebody got, had to run to the store, guess who got to go to the store? It was me. And they had to stay out in the hot sun shoveling two to five gravel. Why does the young guy get to go? Because the boss can trust him. Okay. Zoe, Zoe life. Every place I've worked for. And listen, this is the key to promotion. And if you work this way, if you work this way, even if your boss is not a believer, even if he's unfair, even if he doesn't treat you the way that you actually really should be treated, God will promote you. God will take care of you. The Zoe life is possible in the workplace. This whole section really encompasses the two major, most time-consuming portions of our lives, family and work. And so it's so important that we teach on these things. And both family and work should be a walking testimony of the goodness of God. I just, I don't see in Scripture where believers are so, should be so stressed out because of work that they have to take a pill to stay sane. Right? Or that they have to go to the bar after work so that they can have a drink so that they can keep, have some peace. I just don't, I don't see that in the New Testament. I really see that we should be walking in supernatural peace because we're full of the Spirit of God. The Zoe life, at, and I'll, let's, as we wrap this part up right here before we move into the armor of God, the Zoe life at home and at work doesn't just happen. It doesn't just happen. You're going to have to work at it. You're going to have to be intentional at the Zoe life at work and at home. You're going to have to apply these principles to them. And I've had people say, well, like, man, I tried. I'm like, dude, you tried for a week. It's like, try for a decade. I've been working for Tim, for Tim for over 10 years now. Do you know when I first came on staff, I didn't, Tim didn't listen to me. I didn't know anything. But now he asked my opinion. We actually, me and Tim and Paul and Lucas, we had a disagreement over what we were going to do with the curtain this week. A curtain. But nobody fought, nobody cussed, nobody screamed, nobody threw a fit over it. It's just like, we just saw, we just worked it out. It's okay, it doesn't have to be a big deal. But it's because we've been applying these principles to our life daily, weekly, monthly, yearly. And in due season, I have reaped a reward with Paul and with Tim because I've been diligent. And again, I know I'm, good job, Josh. <laughs> Honoring your boss one time isn't going to change much. Teenagers in the room, young adults, honoring your parents for one moment isn't going to change much. But if we can learn to be consistent over time, 
doing it every day. Fathers, leading your family in a nightly devotion one time isn't going to change the seeds you have sown over the last six years. But if you, can, if you start a pattern where you begin to do nightly devotions, Bible reading, worship of God, and you do that consistently over the next six months, you will reap a reward. I promise you, your whole family and home life will change drastically. There is a reward for this. All right, let's move on. The armor of God, verse 10. A final word, be strong in the Lord and my... Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on God's armor so that you'll be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in heavenly places. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so that you'll be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after you battle, you will be standing firm. Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness. Verse 15, for shoes... Put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you will be fully prepared. In addition to all these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. Put on salvation as your helmet and take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Verse 18, pray in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert. Be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. And pray for me. This is Paul talking. Ask God to give me the right word so I can boldly explain God's mysterious plan that the good news is for the Jews and the Gentiles alike. I am in chains now, still preaching this message as God's ambassador, so pray that I will keep on speaking boldly for him as I should. So this is the end of the letter where Paul says a final word, finally. At, at, so this letter, he has, he has established our place in Jesus. He's given us the basics of the Christian walk. And in this last section, he says, in light of all of this, in light of all what? In light of all that God has done? In light of your standing as his child? In light of uh, uh, the Christian maturity and the growth that he gives you? In light of the conduct? In light of the way that you're supposed to walk in the spirit? In light of these things that I've taught you, this is how he ends. You're in a battle. You're in a battle. You, di you didn't decide to be, but you are. Whether you want to be or not, you're in spiritual warfare. If you are a believer, you are in spiritual warfare. And that's what Paul is talking about here. In light of all this, there is a battle to fight in the Christian life. And I want you to know as we start this, the greatest weapon that we have in spiritual warfare, the greatest weapon that we have in spiritual warfare when we become Christians, when we get saved, is not what we're supposed to say to the devil. Well, the greatest weapon that we have in spiritual warfare is how we live the Zoe life before him. You live the Zoe life before the devil and you defeat him every single time. Listen, my obedience, my surrender, my submission to Christ is the greatest weapon in defeating the one who is the prince of darkness that lives around me. That's my greatest weapon. We live in a hostile world. We have an enemy, but I don't focus on the enemy. I focus on the father. I focus on Jesus, the one who gave me his victory. When I bow and say yes to him and I commit to living out the word of God, I become a fortress that the devil can't knock down. Come on. That is my weapon of warfare. My weapon is my submission to the Lord Jesus Christ. And my submission to him puts on this armor that it's talking about, that he has actually gifted to me. And it says that the armor is for every strategy of the devil. The devil, he's got all kinds of strategies. He's not stupid. He's got all kinds of strategies where he tries to take us out. And you'll need this armor to stand against him in every way. But I love where Paul says, we're not fighting against flesh and blood. And so you've got to know right away, I think many people just, they, we want to pick up our swords. We want to pick up our AR-15s. We want to put on a helmet. We want to put on our body armor. And we want to go to battle. It's like, he's using the soldier thing as an analogy. It's a me It's a metaphor. What Paul, he, Paul is probably in prison writing this and he sees a Roman soldier and he's like, oh, that would be a good analogy. But he's not talking about you literally becoming a Roman soldier. He's talking about the armor of God. He's describing what a normal believer should look like. This is the armor of God. Paul's letting us know in, in, in verse 12, he's letting us know you're currently fighting. You're in a spiritual battle. And, and he's, he's letting you know, hey, there's different ranks. There's different levels. There's different degrees of darkness. And <laughs> the reason that Paul doesn't go down the rabbit hole of what all of them they are is because it's not important. It's because they're all defeated. 
It's because they're all defeated. And too many Christians go down too many rabbit holes where they write books on demons and they give you 12 YouTube videos that you need to watch on how to cast out something and you've got to bind this one together and you've got to fuse that one to the ground and you've got to scream until your throat bleeds to get that one out of here. And Paul's, Paul didn't go down any of those rabbit holes. He just says, hey, there's different rankings, there's different levels, there's different rulers, but Christ is seated far above them all. Far above them all. And he's showing us, walk in the armor of God and you'll always be ready. Don't, you, you don't need the eight steps to cast out the demon of greed. You don't need 12 steps to overcome the, the evil demon of addiction. You don't, we don't need 18 steps to go to hot springs and walk around it 18 times so that we can defeat the power of the crystals. That gets a lot of views on YouTube and sells a lot of books, but Paul, ain't, Paul never says that. Put on the full armor of God. And no strategy of the devil will take you out. God is not, God is not moved by a higher rank. Neither should you be. We see in Romans 8 that nothing can separate us from God's love. We see in Colossians 2 that Christ sits above them all and he disarmed them all on the cross. Ephesians 2 says that we are in him and we are co-seated with him in heavenly places. Now, we don't fight against flesh and blood, but oftentimes it looks like people speaking or persecuting or coming against us. And the devil will use flesh and blood to come against you, but you have to understand it is not the person that you're fighting against. You're actually fighting for their spirit. You're fighting for their soul. They are held captive by a demonic ideology that 2 Corinthians 10 tells us how to wage war against. For though we walk in flesh, we do not war against the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing that has raised itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. The armor of God gives us everything we need to stand against the enemy. And again, don't think of it naturally. This is a supernatural fight, and these weapons are supernatural. We can only stand when we are equipped with the armor God has given us. So the first thing, belt of truth. The belt of truth. We put on the belt of truth. Uh, uh, older translation says that you gird up your loins with the belt, of, the belt of truth. What is truth? Jesus is truth. He is our new nature that we put on. He is the thing that we must tie together to hold the rest of the armor together. We don't do this when we feel like it. We do this daily. The Zoe life will fall apart and off of you if it is not built on truth. The truth of God, the truth about yourself, the truth of God's words. One of the schemes of the devil that we see, we see in Ephesians chapter 4, we see in John 10, is the trickery of men, false teachings. We have to know what truth is. We, even when the enemy came and tempted Christ himself, he used Scripture. He twisted Scripture. He gave partial truths of Scripture. We have to know the whole truth so that we can hold everything else together. The breastplate of righteousness. The, the breastplate of righteousness. And this, this has to do with uh, uh, more than being justified, of more than I've been made righteous, but also that I'm bringing his righteousness into the culture. That, is a, that there is a righteous behavior that flows from this place. Because the Zoe life is more than just not doing the wrong things. The Zoe life is about doing the right things. And so righteousness is not just an identity. Righteousness is the way that I live. Does that make sense? So that, and, the breast, so, and Paul uses the breastplate because righteousness guards my heart because it, it's who I am. So, so it, it, Christ has justified me. He has told me who I am. And so it guards my vital organs so nothing and no one can hurt me. We can no more, no more do battle against the devil in our own righteousness as a soldier would go to war without his breastplate. 2 Corinthians 5.21 shows us that we now have the righteousness of God imputed to us. And when I believe that I am Christ's righteousness, that that's been imputed to me, I have no fear of anything or anyone wounding my vitals anymore. My heart is protected by a status called righteousness. Number three, the shoes of peace for the gospel. I love that it's shoes because we walk in peace. We walk in peace. And Joshua says that, Joshua, wherever your foot treads, that ground I'll give to you. 
Isaiah says of Christ, of his government and peace, there will be no end, that it increases. Where the people of God are, where they work, where they live, where they walk to, they should be bringing the peace of God to that place. Um, and this is peace that we walk in. And, and, and actually, if, so if you do a study of the, the, the Roman armor, the, the Roman shoes, had they were like, they were like archaic uh, uh, cleats. They had spikes on the bottom. So that, they could, so that they could push forward, so they had more grip, so they couldn't be knocked down. That's oftentimes what peace looks like is because you're coming in conflict, but I'm walking in something that I can't be moved out of. Does that make sense? So it doesn't, it, my outward circumstances doesn't matter because I'm seated in Christ. I'm standing with him. And so I have this peace regardless of my circumstances, regardless of what storms are around me, I have peace and I can't be moved out of it. We have a shield of faith. Shield of faith. The Roman shield was head to toe. It was top to bottom, so nothing could penetrate it. And even fiery arrows, they would cover their, they would get their shields wet, so when those fiery arrows hit, it would extinguish them or it wouldn't bother the shield. And so the, our faith is our defense. Our faith is our defense. I heard a pastor say it this way. He said, with the shield of faith, we get to, we get to approach and possibility through the belief of invincibility. We get to approach impossibility through the belief of invincibility. Why? Because no weapon formed against you will prosper. My confidence is in the one who has already won the victory. Faith is believing God is who he said he is, and he's going to do what he said he's going to do. Now, are there storms? Are there problems? Are there issues? Absolutely. Faith doesn't deny that there are problems. It just denies a place of influence of the problem. And so my, sh my faith catches every fiery dart from the devil. Come on. 1 John 5, 4, For every child of God defeats this evil world, and we achieve this victory through our faith. The helmet of salvation. The helmet covers my mind. I have the mind of Christ. I'm saved. This is my identity. Anything that comes in my mind that doesn't agree with that is from the devil. And so my helmet, my mind of Christ, protects me from that. And 1 Thessalonians 5.8 connects the helmet of salvation with the hope of salvation. And so I am saved, and I'm also going to be saved. And so I have nothing to fear. This is why the New Testament church was fearless in the face of persecution, because they knew, even if you kill me, I'm saved. How do you snuff out a religion that believes that? You don't, because every time the church is persecuted, it spreads like wildfire. Not through swinging swords, but simply through living the Zoe life. Come on. Number six, our offensive weapon, the sword of the Spirit. Our offensive weapon. And it says here, it says it is the word of God. The word of God. It's a double-edged sword. Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit. That's an important distinction. Soul and spirit. And actually there's two, there's actually three words, but two words for life that we find in the Greek. The, the suke life and the zoe life. One is soul, one is spirit. The word of God divides. It cuts off my soulish part of me so that I can walk in the spirit. Come on. And, and this, this word, it's not just a word that we keep quiet. It's rhema. It's the spoken word of God. We have to speak God's word. Not our own minds. Not what we think. We have to speak what God's word says. We have to speak God's promises. God's word is what defeats. Come on. The best piece of offensive weaponry that you have, church, is thus says the Lord. Thus says the Lord that you are the head and not the tail. That you are above only and not beneath. That you are the lender and not the borrower. That every place your foot treads, that ground he gives to you. You begin speaking these promises of God over your life and you see it do warfare. Come on. It pierces the darkness. And then verse 18, he goes on, which I believe is just an elaboration of the sword of the Spirit. It's continued of an explanation of Rhema to speak the word of God. He talks about praying in the Spirit, the sword of the Spirit. And this can be praying in tongues, your prayer language, doing spiritual warfare, making intercession, he says, stay alert, be persistent, listen to the Spirit. We have got to pray. You can, you can get all dressed up for battle, but if you don't pray, you're useless. 
You can get all dressed up for battle, but if you don't pray, you're useless because your prayers release the power of God into the atmosphere. Okay, well, I try to pray until something happens. And Paul even says, hey, pray for me so that I can boldly proclaim the gospel so that it will continue to go further. How much are we praying for our pastors? How much are we praying for our missionaries? How much are we praying for our evangelists? How much are we praying for our prophets? How much are we praying for those who are speaking the word of God? How much are we praying for each other that we would have the boldness to speak the word of God? Prayer is the way that we go into battle. I'm closing. I know it's past eight. I can see some of you. I'm losing you. You're fading fast. Past your bedtime. Why armor? Why this talk of warfare? The Roman Empire, the pagan empire, was conquering the world through flesh and blood, through the natural, wep- through natural weapons, through demonic influence. And Paul here is subverting that. He's showing us that all of the unseen rulers have been unseated through Christ's victory. And we would simply, by living the Zoe life, we would conquer the world. We would turn it upside down, not with weapons like swords, catapults, tanks, guns, but with truth, righteousness, peace, the gospel, the word of God. When we walk in these things, supernaturally, the world will change around us. This armor's tried and true. Jesus did it. The apostles did it. They changed the world in 300 years. This armor is tried and true. It's conquered the world. God's power is far above the devil's power. The devil is not God's opposite. God has no opposite. He has no rival. He has no equal. You put God's power and the devil's power on a scale next to each other, it's nothing. He's far above. It's not even comparable. And it's by his grace that we get to stand in this power. The great, and here's the, here it is, the greatest place of spiritual warfare in our daily lives is right here, our thoughts. We have got to get our thoughts to match up with his thoughts because we give the devil and demons way too much credit. The devil has got us deceived because he knows what you could be more than you know what you could be. Mm. It's a struggle. Our struggle is to believe truth. The truth is that, and to believe the truth that God is who he, really, who he says he is and that we are who he says we are. We need to be aware of the demonic, yes, but that's not our focus. Our focus is on being surrendered and being spirit-filled because that's where the power comes from. I want to end, by, end with this quote by Bishop Hanley Mole. He said, The gospel found slavery in the world and in, in many regions, particularly the Roman and the Greek. It was, very, it was a very bad form of slavery. The gospel began at once to undermine it with its mighty principles of equality of all souls in the mystery and dignity of manhood and of the equal work of redeeming love wrought for all souls by the supreme master. But its plan was not to batter, but to undermine. So while the gospel in one aspect, respect, left slavery alone, it doomed it in another. That's spiritual warfare. That's spiritual warfare. We live the Zoe life and the pagan life begins to fall apart around us. Amen. Y'all stand. Let me pray for you. Lord, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you so much that you have given us this armor. Teach us how to walk in it, God. Teach us how to live this Zoe life. Teach us how to be parents of our kids how to train them up in the way they should go. God, we want to put our hand in your hand. We want to co-labor with you and partner with you to raise up the next generation of burning hearts that will continue to carry this mantle forward, continue to build your kingdom. God, fill us with your spirit as we go to work tomorrow, as we live out, maybe that that we would have a, a shifting in our thinking. God, we repent for not seeing work the way that you see it, Lord. Lord, help us to be joyful workers, that, that joyful bosses, that, that we would walk in your peace, that we would walk in your joy, that we would walk in your love, knowing that we can, by your grace, by, by your power, change the world around us, God. We're so thankful for your book to Ephesus, God, that has taught us that we are in you and that we now get to walk like you. Lord, we love you. We surrender to you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, church. 
Thank you for listening to this message from Christian Ministries Church. If this message impacted you and you'd like to sow into our ministry, you can give at cmchurch.com. If you'd like to listen to more of our messages, you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Just search for Christian Ministries. God bless.